So, tonight we're going to be talking about warrant. And is Christian belief warranted without evidence, right? So, a bunch of fancy big words that I didn't know six months ago. Um, An introduction to Reformed epistemology, right? So, we're going to start by kind of pulling the crowd. Um, True or false, is it wrong to believe anything without sufficient evidence? So you don't have enough evidence. Is it wrong to believe in that? True. True. True? Raise your hand. hand Yeah. Yes. No. Maybe so. It's not a trick question. It's a pretty simple statement. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. Now here's where it's going to get a little bit dicier. Uh, Is it wrong to believe in God without sufficient evidence? Yes. Yes. Okay. Seeing the yeses. All right. Cool, right? It comes down to a matter what you consider evidence, right? Um, so, the crucial question that we've been attacking all semester um, is the claim that it is irrational to believe in God without sufficient evidence. There is no evidence for God. Therefore, theistic belief is irrational, right? So that's kind of the premise that we're going to be attacking tonight. Um, and so, all semester long, we've been focusing on the second point, which discusses the fact that there's no evidence for God. So all semester we've been going over things like the cosmological argument, the te- tele- I can't say that word, um, the axiological argument, um, all those good things, which are basically ways that we show that creation, um, philosophy can all point back to a creator of the universe that we call God, right? Um, and as you see, we have this little pyramid here. So the base is natural theology, and natural theology, what it is, is it's kind of like looking at your outside world. How does that point back to God? Um, And then over the course of the semester, we spent about the middle of the semester responding to atheistic objections um, for Christianity. And we kind of capped it off over the past couple weeks with the historical accounts of Jesus and the resurrection. Right. Um, And so now tonight, now that we've addressed the evidence for God claim over the course of the semester, which y'all can all go listen to on the podcast and the YouTube channel, not to plug. But um, the question we're going to be addressing tonight is the fact is it irrational to believe in God without sufficient evidence? So we all, like, most of us raised our hands, like, you shouldn't believe in God if there isn't enough evidence. But the claim we're going to be discussing tonight is, is that a true statement, right? So, um, an overview of tonight, basically, we're going to be following, working through this book, um, Knowledge and Christian Belief, broke my brain several times. Um, But it's basically written by a guy named Alvin Plantinga, and it takes aim at the objection to Christian belief, which basically says it's irrational to be a Christian without sufficient evidence. Um, This is based off of a condition called classical foundationalism, and which basically is the claim we laid out a few minutes ago with the, you know, you need evidence to believe something, and if you don't have evidence, therefore it's not worthy of belief. Um, So what Plantinga does is he objects to this form of foundationalism. He proposes a new epistemology, which is a big word. Um, It basically just means way of thinking, way of thinking. He defends it. He applies it to Christian belief, and then he defends how it applies to Christian belief and shows that Christian belief is a rational thing. Um, So, this is Alvin Plantinga, the man, the myth, the legend. Um, One of the most influential philosophers of the 20th century. Did a lot of work at Notre Dame. Um, He's known for his work on the problem of evil, um, epistemology, which we're going to be discussing tonight, metaphysics, and theistic arguments. Um, So, this trilogy right here, right there, um, (laughs) is totally a massive piece of work that he's done over many, many years um, that we are going to be very minimally diving into tonight. Oh, the screen didn't update? Oh, look at that. There we go. All right. This is Alvin Plantinga, guys. Those are his books. All right. Um, so, there we go. Okay. So, some good definitions for tonight that are helpful to know. Um, epistemology. Big word I said a second ago. It's the study of how we know things. So the study of knowledge, the study of belief, right? How do we come to believe what we believe? Um, that is built on the grounds of knowledge. Knowledge, what is that? It's something we truly believe plus a little bit of magic sauce, right? And that magic sauce is warrant, right? Which is kind of a vague term that we're going to be investigating a lot tonight. And warrant is built on the grounds of rationality. So when you're rational, you haven't made any reasoning errors or any logicking, not logicking, any logistical errors, right? And so, when you are a rational person, therefore, if you have something and it is a rational claim, it is therefore a warranted claim, right? So, it's kind of like a pyramid that stacks up on each other. Um, Another thing we're going to be discussing is a basic belief. A basic belief is a belief that is not inferred from others. So, this can go from anything across the board. So, if I have a hunch that it's going to snow tomorrow, 
And I really believe that. That is a basic belief because I don't have any evidence for that. I just believe it, right? However, a properly basic belief is one that we assume something, but it's okay. So now um, an example of this would be nothing can be completely red and completely not red at the same time, right? Like there's no way for something to be red and not red. It's not possible, right? And this is something we don't necessarily have to debate in order to see, right? It's not something we reason through, right? You didn't sit here and we talked about it for an hour. You accept it, right? It's something you see and you accept, or two plus two is four, right? You understand it and you accept it. Um, There we go, okay. So tonight we're going to be talking about whether it's rational to hold Christian beliefs, um, and that's whether Christian belief can be justified or warranted, right? So we're going to be walking through Planica's system of epistemology, which is typically called reformed epistemology, which basically tries to define the criteria for determining if a belief has warrant, right? Um, So we will be discussing the broad definition of knowledge and warrant and the proposed criteria for said warrant and if a Christian's belief can be considered rational at the end of the day. Yes. I'm not entirely clear on the difference uh, on the previous slide between the difference. Uh, uh, sorry, the difference go back? between justified, yeah. rational, and warranted. Justified. I, I think I get rational and warranted, but. Um, okay, so justified basically is a system of. How to explain this? I like to think of it in a way that is basically like justification means I'm sound in my belief, right? Okay. Um, And so if I have a justified belief, then it is a legit potential belief that I don't have any epistemic, which like believing grounds, right? Um, I don't have any epistemic failure in accepting that belief, right? So we all have this moral duty to accept what we know as knowledge, right? Or else we'd be liars. And so a justified belief is one that doesn't have any epistemic um, failure across it, if that makes sense. They're, they're very similar, yes. Um, cool. Okay, so little roadmap for tonight. Um, we're going to be starting on questions like classical foundationalism, evidentialism, and some de jure objections. Then we're going to move to a model, a case study, and how all this applies to God, right? So first step is the questions, right? So now it's time for some holy encouragement for the believers in the room. Um, so these are some examples of de jure objections. A de jure, uh, I, I think it's de jure. A de jure objection is one that refutes a claim using an argument that cannot be necessarily quantified, right? So it's not like, oh, I see that you have three apples, but you say I have five. It's more like the argument you're proposing is immoral, it's irrational, it's foolish, it's unjustified, or in some other way deficient, right? Um, so now just to read through a couple of these. Um, religion is the process of an unconscious wish fulfillment, where for certain people, if the process did not take place, it would put them in self-danger of becoming t- or of coming to mental harm, being unable to cope with the idea of a godless, purposeless life, right? Religion is the sigh of an oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, just as it is the spirit of a spiritless situation. It is the opium of the people. It is wrong always, everywhere, and for anyone to believe anything on insufficient evidence, Right? So, what do all of these beliefs, have in, all these statements have in common? Anybody want to take a stab? What's up, Sam? We sort of assume that religion doesn't have evidence to it? Yes. So, that belief in God is irrational, right? So, they're all kind of claiming, so Karl Marx, I think, yeah, I think it was Marx, basically said that religion is a drug that people use to get through life, um, Freud says that it's basically wish fulfillment. I want there to be a God, and I think there's a God, so therefore there is a God. What's up, Sam? So it's actually nothing to do with the evidence. None of those people are, are, well, I guess Clifford is kind of commenting on the evidence. But the other two aren't commenting directly on any evidence for God. They're just saying, before you even start to consider evidence for God, you've kind of got a, a mountain to climb regarding you can't possibly deny God. Yes. Yes. So they're kind of enforcing a double standard. Um, They're operating out of the basis of theism, and therefore you need to prove the existence of theism, right? Um, Whereas 
they don't necessarily have to prove the existence of their atheism, if that makes sense. Regardless of the evidence, or before you even talk about any of the evidence. Exactly. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So now, classical foundationalism. Um, it's beliefs that are formed. It's the idea we tossed around earlier about beliefs being formed on the basis of insufficient evidence. Um, and so, what are what are the uh, ideas with this? Right. So, are beliefs formed on the basis of insufficient evidence irrational? If you don't have enough is evidence, is it irrational to believe something? Um, not quite, because this would lead to an infinite regress, um, and some beliefs cannot have sufficient evidence in order to be believed. So it basically kind of starts you down this rabbit hole. Well, I believe A. Okay, well, A has to be justified by B. Okay, but now that I believe B, I have to justify it with C. And C has to be justified, so now I have to justify it with D. And then you keep going down the rabbit hole, and you're never going to actually get to a solid ground. Um, so John Locke, the creator of fashional, um, classical foundationalism, was entirely aware of this. It was his idea that some beliefs are certain, and beliefs that are certain, he thought, can be properly and be accepted in the basic way. So like we were talking about a second ago with basic and properly basic beliefs. Um, so now there's two types of beliefs. Um, there's non-basic beliefs, and there's basic beliefs. So non-basic beliefs are warranted on the basis of basic beliefs. They're all built on singularly basic ideas. Um, and basic beliefs are foundational. They form the entire system of our thinking. They are incorrigible, which means they are impossible to falsify, and they are self-evident. Right? So now, to define some terms there, incorrigible is a belief that you cannot reasonably correct someone of. So if I come to you and I tell you that my stomach hurts and I am in pain, you cannot reasonably correct me and tell me that I am not in pain because you cannot experience that. Right? That is an, that is an idea of an incorrigible belief. Um, a self-evident belief is something you don't need to argue for or against. You can plainly just see that it is true. Like the example earlier with the something cannot be completely red and completely not red, or 2 plus 2 is 4, or the sky is blue, right? Um, so, you don't, so you can be justified in believing the basic beliefs without having to provide any evidence because they are based on perception, right? Um, so... Summary of classical foundationalism, kind of summing up, summarizing this idea, um, is that there are basic beliefs which are either incorrigible or self-evident, and all these beliefs and all other beliefs must be formed via deduction from these beliefs, and anything else is irrational. So if you don't have something that is built on basic beliefs, it therefore isn't right. Okay? However, is this scope of basic beliefs too narrow? Um... I would say it's way too strict. So beliefs about the past are properly basic, but aren't included in this idea, right? So is it irrational to believe something based off your memory? So if I wake up in the morning with a bruise on my knee and I remember that I hit my knee like jogging two days ago, is that wrong of me to assume that that came from there? Um, it fails because there are so many things that expand past it, if that makes sense. Um, so there's irrationality, or there's irrationality that comes from this idea, right? And so beliefs about the past need to be basic because if we didn't have basic beliefs about the past, you literally wouldn't be able to justify anything other than this instant moment. You wouldn't be able to justify what you had for breakfast. You wouldn't be able to justify what you did last week. None of it would be self-evident, right? Um, and our beliefs are based off of our memory, right? So in this model, it is irrational because it's non-evidential, right? So our memory doesn't have evidence with it, right? So that therefore makes our memory irrational, which c totally collapses the idea of classical foundationalism, right? And therefore, because classical foundationalism... Um, it's kind of the circular argument, and you can see that it's self-defeating because classical foundationalism is not self-evident, and it is not incorrigible, right? So therefore, it totally usurps its own premises. Does that make sense? So basically, could we say that what Plantinga is argu arguing here is that there are lots of examples of things that are properly basic, 
but don't meet these narrow criteria that John Locke came up with you know, 150 years ago. Yes, exactly. Yeah, everything yeah, kind of really crumbles. Really good. Because it's like you can you can know you exist, but you can't know anybody else's yeah. having internal conflict. That's true. Um, and so, as you can see, classical foundationalism kind of collapses upon further inspection, right? Ooh. Is the zoom frozen for y'all? I'm frozen on the little thing. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. So next, we're going to be approaching the model, right? Um, so the model, we're going to be kind of going through knowledge, basic beliefs, and we're going to eventually lay out all of Reformed epistemology. All right. Pause. Pause. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, so if we can't trust classical foundationalism, then what are we going to use? Um, so as we've kind of been discussing, Plantinga has two major objections. Um, to classical foundationalism. There's a wide array of beliefs that we take to be basic that are not in his criteria, and classical foundationalism in itself is not self-evident or incorrigible, therefore it's self-defeating. Right? So next, does the slide even go? Maybe? There we go. Okay, so questions that we want to answer tonight. Um, what does it mean to be rational? What is knowledge? What is justified or warranted belief? How do we determine if a basic belief is warranted, right? So the idea, the roadmap we're going to kind of move through is we have a belief, right? We accept this belief as truth. We find warrant, which is evidence and rationality that goes along with it. This makes it knowledge and true belief, which then makes it a rational belief that is rational and evidential to accept. Does that make sense? Tracking? Um, but tonight, the main... Our, most of our focus is going to kind of be on this linking factor of warrant. So, the criteria for a warranted belief. Um, I didn't like the S&P thing, so we've been using Carol, the Christian, and Alvin, the atheist, so I'm going to use Carol's name instead of S. Um, so, the criteria that Plantinga lays out for a warranted belief is that if Carol has belief in P, it is only warranted if her cognitive faculties are functioning properly, if her cognitive environment is similar to one which her cognitive faculties were designed for, right? So our brains are meant to be in oxygen. If you try to go think of philosophy at the bottom of the ocean after you've been holding your breath for 10 minutes, it's not going to work well, right? Um, this design plan um, that governs the production of our beliefs is aimed at producing true belief and that it is such a good design plan that it is most likely successful in producing this true belief. So, a little uh, applied part of this is the idea of a machine. So, you take a blimp, right? So, its proper function is that it is working correctly, right? All the gears are turning, all that good stuff. In order for a blimp to be functioning properly, it needs to be in the air, right? A blimp can't fly on the ground or in the ocean. Um, its design plan has to be aimed at truth. It is supposed to fly. It is designed to fly. It's not designed to drive or designed to swim, right? And it is pretty good at getting to the truth. And so when we throw this blimp up in the air, it's pretty good at flying. It's going to sit there for a pretty good time, right? Okay, so now we're going to kind of go into a case study. Um, so how do we, we have a model of epistemology now. We have a criteria for warranted belief, which is kind of this connecting idea between what we believe and knowledge, right? So how do we apply it? Well, first off, we choose a basic belief one that we believe without evidence and that we can accept. We determine the par parameters for warrant in that belief, right? The same things we just laid out, are our cognitive faculties working correctly, etc. And then we evaluate if that belief is warranted. So do all our criteria match up with what we need? Um, so now we're going to kind of hop into a little case study on theism. So Plantinga argues that if God exists, he is successfully constituted Carol's cognitive faculties in such a way that they are properly functioning 
in the environment for which they are meant. This would produce a belief that God exists, and then Carol's belief that God exists is easily warranted, even apart from argumentation, right? Um, and since the belief in existence of God does not depend on arguments and would be formed through the proper function of Carol's cognitive faculties, Carol's belief should be considered properly basic. Um, so this comes from an idea referred to as the sensus divinitatis, which is, I believe, developed by Calvin, I believe is the one who coined that term. Um, so this model that we have right here, that we have an ingrained sense in us that a creator instilled in us, right, to believe in a God. So therefore, we apparently have this idea of a God, right, as a natural functioning of our brain. Um, Pinega calls this the Aqu Aquinas slash Calvin model, the AC model for short. Um, and basically what it is, is it's a extended way of addressing this idea of reformed epistemology, right? Um, and so it's important to clarify that the types of experiences covered here, um, like in this part, right? So it, on the part that says God's existence becomes immediately apparent. So now if we have a belief, right? So say I'm climbing a mountain and in all of its grandeur and its size and the beauty of the rocks and the lakes and all that stuff, I come across this natural belief that God is a creator, right? And there has to be someone big enough to create all this. It couldn't have come from nowhere. Or say I have some moral failure. And in my moral fa failure, I feel this sudden conviction of guilt, and I'm aware that there's a higher power that disapproves of me because I've morally failed, right? Um, so in these cases, I'm not being made aware that there is a God. I'm not arguing that there is a God. I'm simply immediately aware of beliefs that entail the existence of God. So it's not like, man, I fell into sin. Man, I really failed God, right? That's saying I failed God. It's not, oh, there must be a God that exists now because I feel really bad about doing that. It's kind of a fine line to walk, but if you see it, you can kind of understand it. So these are not the sorts of arguments that you take to a lecture hall or to a conversation with um, a philosopher, but, but this is the sort of thing which your experiences it, uh, kind of justify by themselves. Yes. So we're kind of talking, we're talking about the idea of properly basic beliefs, right? And so in climbing this mountain or whatever I'm doing or in my sin, I am suddenly aware and I've suddenly accepted the fact and I now believe that there is a God that he's either created or I have failed a God morally. Does that make sense? Like it's just something that you accept because it's properly believed. And it's properly basic. Um, so now, um, this is funny. So he has the AC model. It's like his really like super fancy like philosophical topic. Um, and I think, yes, Aquinas and Calvin model. Um, and then he just randomly, you know how the news will go and like do local radio chats? His AC went out, and so there's this whole clip of him on the internet uh, talking about the AC unit, and it's nothing to do with philosophy. And so if you look it up, you'll totally get a video about him inspecting his radiator. Um, so the AC model um, basically is set up by Plantinga on the writings of Thomas Aquinas and John Calvin. Um, God created human beings with the belief of producing processes called the sensus divinitatis. Right? We have a natural desire to believe in a God. Um, this di census divinitatis works to produce beliefs about God and namely his existence. So like the idea we were talking about a minute ago, either hiking in the mountains or falling into sin. Um, and so because these are properly basic beliefs, they meet the previously discussed conditions for warrant. Right? So they're immediately apparent and we accept them based off of their properly basic belief. So, now the big question, how does this apply to Christianity, right? We're doing philosophy, but there's nothing about Jesus or anything like that yet. So, this is where planning it gets interesting. The extended Aquinas and Calvin model um, claims that these beliefs do not come by way of the sensus divinitatis, memory or perception or testimony or reason alone, but rather they come by way of the internal instigation of the Holy Spirit, Right? Um, so the Holy Spirit enlightens truth and gets us to accept the gospel, right? He makes it apparent to us. Um, and so this doesn't breach this criteria that we've set up for justified, rational, warranted belief, 
right? And we're not violating any of our epistemic virtues by taking hold of this belief. Because if we have a Holy Spirit inside of us that is showing us that something is true, then it is therefore rational and warranted because we can accept it in the properly basic way. Does that make sense? Right? Um, so therefore, Christian belief can be accepted in a properly basic way because you have the Holy Spirit illuminating the truth of it to you because that's how you were built, right? Under this model, you were built to have the Holy Spirit to show you the truth of the gospel, right? And so therefore, when you have the Holy Spirit showing you the truth of the gospel, you are properly functioning in the environment for which you were designed. And your cognitive faculties are working in the way for which they were designed, right? Does that make sense? Um, and so then this leads to faith, right? All right, now what is faith? So this is the churchy word that gets thrown on, right? Just go have faith, brother. Got you, right? So um, faith is produced by the internal instigation of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit stirring something up inside of you, right? Um, and so it's knowledge of a certain and special kind, right? So if the subject matter is true, if faith is based on a true belief, it is something that we can't even comprehend because it is, it is such a stunning and beautiful concept, right? It is ultimately unmatched, and it is the thing, the most important thing to utter believe in this entire world, right? If this is true, it is the most important thing you can think about. So, and it is known by a way of extraordinary cognitive process. It's not our own logic. It's not our own reason. It's not our own basic ideas and our mind just kind of thinking through things. It is you functioning at your properly most designed, like you're running at your highest capacity, because you are in the environment for which you were designed, right? Because you have this enlightenment and this instigation and this internal witness of the Holy Spirit, right? Um, and then throw a little scripture at you. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. So what do you notice that's similar? We just talked about that theism case study, right? About me going hiking in the mountains where apparently there was something that was I saw and then something unknown suddenly became known to me, right? So it's the assurance of things hoped for, and it's the conviction, the conviction that there is a creator of things not seen, right? What's up? So the concern with classical foundationalism is that it didn't have enough room in it for things that we really do believe and we're pretty sure, like the reality of the past and the existence of other minds. But... Now I'm a little concerned that this doesn't prove too much, that this doesn't have too much leeway. For example, a Christian would obviously uh, probably have some interest in disputing the truth claims of um, Islam or Mormonism, etc. Um, but don't these beliefs get the same uh, treatment as Christianity is getting right here? Um. It would according to the original AC model because the AC model before it was extended to Christianity only defended theism which is the idea that there is a personable creator that is involved in our lives and in our world. It is not specific to Christianity. It is not specific to Islam. It is not specific to Judaism or anything else across the board. Right. Christianity, we see the extended AC model where we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. So 1 Corinthians 2 says who can know the depths of a person except for the spirit of that person um, and who can know the depths of God except for the spirit of God and then it says but we have been given that spirit right and so Christianity is the only religion in which you have God part of the Trinity living inside of you and revealing the truth and the nature of Christianity to you it is alone in that sense does that make sense does that answer your question in some regard? Uh, I think so, yeah. Okay. Also, there's defeaters, right? Is that yes. true? So, yes. like, you, you could have, you could come to know, let's see, what was Sam asking, like, um, you could have a properly basic. Ooh, so, sorry. Uh, Mormons uh, have an yeah. experience that they call the burning. Right, uh, burning in the bosom. Burning in the bosom. Right. Um, and so then, if you went further with your properly basic belief, there could be defeaters that, that you would have to consider against your your census divinitatis or whatever, and um, 
and you could refine your yes yeah so that's that's the next slide after this one so we've kind of already talked through this one um but basically the holy spirit kind of shows us the truth um and then what is the need for scripture if we have the holy spirit because he does all the work right um so when we have the internal instigation of the holy spirit plus scripture which is the ornate inerrant truth of god's word right we have this faith producing process that is initiated um and through scripture and the teachings of god um in christianity the holy spirit seals the word of god upon our hearts right and so that's a very churchy term very like oh whatever um and so this basically says under the model of christianity we are broken sinners and our affections are not the affections of god right scripture says the heart of man is wicked and god is perfect so therefore those are opposites right so as we read scripture and the holy spirit helps us interpret this scripture right we start to develop a hatred for sin our affections get shifted to the affections of god and our thoughts get shifted to the thoughts of god it's a process if you want to use another churchy word called sanctification which basically means becoming more like god right um in belief and so romans 8 15 through 18 says when we cry abba father it is the spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God and if children then heirs heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him in order we may be glorified with him right so the Holy Spirit witnesses to our spirit and shows it the truth of the gospel right so that is how we can under this model see that Christianity is warranted true and rational so now the defeaters that Julie was talking about are right here, right? Um, so Planica believes that if there is a rational defeater for Christianity, then epistemologically, I'm pretty sure I said that wrong, it is irrational to continue believing, right? Um, so what this is saying is if you're going to object to Christianity, we have these de jure objections at the beginning, right? Which were like Christianity is immoral, Christianity is foolish, right? Nothing evidential, just ideas, claims without evidence. So here Planiga is arguing that without evidence, Christianity is warranted and justified, right? And so if you're going to object to Christianity, you need an evidential claim that says, no, Christianity is false because A, B, and C, not just, I don't think it's right. Does that make sense? been talking about at this point isn't about is Christianity true it's about if it's true then can you believe in it yes okay exactly okay, okay. I, I think I understand oh. a little bit better now. yeah so if Christianity is true then we are built in a way where we need the Holy Spirit in order to interpret and so therefore if we are a Christian and we have fully examined the evidential claims against Christianity, and we find nothing wrong with them, and we can still continue in believing our Christianity, and we don't find evidential basis to reject it, and then we are completely warranted and justified and rational in accepting true Christian belief. Right? Um, what's up? So, are you ba basically, right here, what you're saying is that if, so if Christianity is true, and you believe Christianity without evidence, knowing nothing else, you can be justified to believe that. However, as soon as somebody comes to you with evidence against Christianity, you have to deal with that evidence. Otherwise, at that point, you are irrational, right? That's what you're saying? Yes. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Um, so we spent a lot of this semester addressing some of these defeaters. So the book we're going off of tonight, The Knowledge and Christian Belief, highly recommend. It's like 12 bucks on Amazon. Um, this book, the last three or four chapters kind of cover the main objections to Christianity that we have addressed this semester, so I'm not going to explicitly address them now. Um, but those are questions like the problem of evil. If God is good and he is perfect, why bad in the world, right? Like, why is that? Um, and, you know, other ideas that are kind of like the, he, it was just basically the big three objections to Christianity. And so we address, we've addressed a lot of those in a lot of detail this semester. If you are interested in that, we have a YouTube channel. We have a podcast. Go listen to those. Um, you know, 
eternal time isn't, or investing in eternity isn't time wasted, right? Um, and so this, Julie, would answer your question about other religions, right? And so if we have this epistemic virtue to accept things that are warranted, right, and we have this model for which we can have warranted religious belief, and under the extended AC model, we have warranted Christian belief, right? And in order to reject the truth of Christianity, we would need to have an evidential claim to reject it. So therefore, in order to, you could apply that to other religions as well. If you find a evidential claim that is wrong with another religion, then it is irrational to go on believing it. And the same applies to Christianity, if that makes sense. Yes? Okay. All right, so kind of wrap it up. Um, objections to the rationality of Christian belief are not easily distanced from the truth of those beliefs. If Christianity is true, then there are certain metaphysical implications that we can confer warrant independent of evidence, right? So we can believe, we have warranted belief outside of evidential claims. Um, so if any objection is going to come to Christianity, it has to be on the basis of independent argument for the falsity of the entirety of Christianity. So you basically have to break Christianity in order to reject it. What do you mean metaphysical implications? Um, the Holy Spirit, basically. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Um, so, if you want more resources on this, um, this is the big trilogy I was talking about earlier. Those books would break my brain in pieces, so I did not read them. Um, but Planning a dedicated decades of his life to those three books. So if you really are interested in this idea, he expands upon a ton of different topics within them. Um, the warranted Christian belief is the big heavy hitter of that triad. Um, and it's basically summed up in this little book, which we're going over today. Um, and that really easy read and really, really intriguing. Highly recommend it. Um, and then there's Religious Epistemology uh, by Tyler D. McNabb. What is the question by Alvin Plantinga? And is belief in God properly basic by Alvin Plantinga? And those are all shorter essays. Um, obviously take a lot less time to read and are not necessarily as intellectually challenging. But I would highly recommend for a starting ground this book. It's written at a popular level so we can understand it. You don't have to have a whole dictionary sitting next to your side when you try to read three pages, right? So highly recommend. Great read. Um, but with that, um, I kind of like to open up the floor to questions, if anybody has any. Um, thoughts, critiques? So a lot of this is going with the idea that Christianity is true. The, if Christianity is true, then you're warranted in believing it without evidence. Yes. Due to its nature. Yes. So, so okay, go ahead. Sorry. So how would that work with a person who isn't convinced that Christianity is true? Like, oh, well, in that case, then, then like, we would ask, well, why don't you think Christianity is true? Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. so this argument so, is just designed, basically, you can't call a Christian irrational for believing without evidence unless you have provided them with, with a defeater that shows why Christianity would be false. Merely the fact that they believe without evidence is not sufficient for them to be irrational. Um, however, if you can provide them with a defeater and they can't answer that defeater, now they are irrational. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I, I guess that's okay. important because you know, my grandparents probably believed without evidence. You know, they they didn't have ratio Christie back <laughs> back in their days. Uh, I mean, I'm sure they still thought about these things, but there are a lot of resources nowadays that they didn't have access to. Yeah, I think that's kind of so.
intimately familiar with the weather and can just tell you directly. Um, is the, does that farmer need to be, does he have to know meteorology to the same level of degree as somebody else to be warranted in believing those right. sort of things? Even if those two lines of evidence are you know, independent. And it's a similar argument. It's saying that if this Christianity belief is true, then you actually can be warranted in believing it in a non-evidential way. Yep. Can you go back a handful of slides? Yes. Oh. I think I can. Yes, I can. Keep, keep going. Keep, keep going. Go. Keep going. Yeah, 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 that one. Oh. Criteria for warrants and belief, that one. No, I think this is the next one. Yeah, the, the back. You want the diagram? I want the diagram. The diagram Check. always helps me a lot. The one that has you want truth the and then warranted. I think it worked. Hold up. Oh, there we go. There we go. There we go. Okay, cool. I need to look at this for a minute or two. <laughs> So normally we'd, we would say, Sam, that the warrant is evidential things, right? That we Okay. You know, oh, that's a okay. good point. Right. So, so normally you would say, you know, I have a belief that's true because it's based on evidence. It becomes knowledge to me and it's rational. It right? kind of feels like classical foundationalism fits under. Uh, reformed epistemology. It's a like subset. It's yeah. a yeah. subset of warrant. Yeah. Uh, yes. All the all the evidence and all the all the properly basic beliefs that Locke wanted to have, you can still have. Yeah, yes. basically what Landinga says oh. is you have these three categories, self-evident, incorrigible, and which whatever the other one is, circular or something like that. Mm -hmm. And he says, Cool, those are clearly properly basic beliefs. You it's rational to believe them and you can't have evidence for them. However, there are lots of other things that you believe. I believe that this body is my body and not somebody else's body. I believe that you have a mind, even though, how do I know that you have a mind? I believe that the past exists and it's not just an illusion. You know, all, all these things that you believe that don't fit into those categories that are still clearly properly based in beliefs. I think the, the, the thing that's really throwing me off is according to this diagram, there could be something that is completely true, but if you don't have warrant to believe it, if you if you don't have if you haven't gone through the checklist, then you can't call it knowledge, even if it's true. Oh, absolutely. Right. Yes, right. There, there are oh, that's so, that's very true. That so, could be true. Well, oh, think about this: Are there an odd number or an even number of grains of sand on the moon? Everybody guess. Fifty percent of you will be right. <laughs> <laughs> it is not a warrant. Well, I mean, belief. if we all choose the odd for some reason, yeah. then I mean, okay. there's a well, chance that one hundred percent of us are correct or incorrect. That would be on average. average. Some of you will probably be correct, and that's not a warranted belief. Well, I I think on our on our understanding the properly basic, you know, on how you gave it, it's interesting because we we. We immediately think of like our grandparents or great grandparents who held properly basic beliefs <laughs> and probably didn't have to, uh, n no one came with them with a defeater, mm. right? And it's basically based on their culture, yeah. maybe. But today, if you have a properly basic belief, the Holy Spirit has witnessed to you the truth of the gospel, you accept it, chances are you got to go further and mm. have some evidence because someone is going to. Uh, challenge you on your properly yep. basic belief uh, as a defeater, an objection to Christianity that you're going to need evidence for. Yeah, First so Peter says we're, we're in a different position than, I'm, than my great grandparents were. Maybe. Yeah. You know. And um, so First Peter says, you know, be always prepared to give an answer for your belief um, and to justify it, right? Which is what we're doing right here. Um, but yeah, that's actually one of the things. That right there is one of the things that grieves me the most about the church that was, you know, the older church, is you found a lot of people that were repulsed by the church because they had questions like this, and the church didn't want to answer them, right? Um, and they didn't really want to elaborate on them or have challenges to these properly basic beliefs, right? Because, yes, they are justified in holding them, 
But as Julie was saying, we need to go deeper and we need to see the evidence, right? Um, to the believers in the room, I would point to Paul, right? Paul, when he's out and he's witnessing in Acts, right? The word that he's using, he's arguing in the courtyard, right? And that word is apologia, which is where we get apologetics, which is what this organization is based on, right? Um, and apologia basically means logicking and reasoning and debating, right? So we're talking through the, I guess, intellectual interferences to the gospel, right? So this is something we've seen since day one that has been lately in the modern church or the church of the past century or two kind of factored out. Um, because we accept things on faith and we are saved by faith as Christians, right? But at the same time, we're still called to be prepared to give an answer for anything. Um, so if you have a question that you're wrestling with, please reach out to one of us. Um, believe it or not, like this is something we want to run alongside you with and want to process and wrestle and get in the mud with you. Um, like challenge our beliefs. Like let's get into it. Like let's look at it. Let's examine the evidence. Um, because if we find an evidential defeater, then Christianity is an irrational, right? So if then you would help us be epi epistemically virtuous, right, as believers, right? And if it goes vice versa, then we're helping a non-believer come up with the idea and help them function to their highest capacity and operate in the environment for which they are designed. Does this argument cut both ways? Could there be such a thing as anti-warrant? <laughs> like, hey, you're in a bad environment, so therefore you can't form good beliefs. Yes. I think that's kind of what you were talking about with the whole, if you're at the bottom of the ocean, holding your breath for 10 minutes. Right. Yes. So would that be kind of what Marx was accusing us earlier of doing, is saying, hey, you're basically drugged up. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're on that drugs. Is, well, you can't, you can't opioids. That, that is kind of what I was actually kind of thinking about next is a lot of this is on the idea that um, that if there is this inherent truth that you are um, designed to accept and understand, then you're warranted, like if this is true, then you're warranted in believing it. Mm -hmm. But I guess my question is how would you distinguish that from being flawed in a way where you would think that this is an inherent truth that you properly believe in, but it, there is no such one that exists. It's a properly basic belief. So that's well, the whole the whole point of a properly basic belief is it's literally impossible to prove it. So right. unless you have a piece of evidence that actually shows you that it's false, you can't say it's. There, there's it, it's something that you naturally believe, and it. So you just believe it. It's just yes. the way it is. So you can, you can decide to question all those beliefs, but you'll very quickly find out that once you start questioning your properly basic beliefs, you either have to decide you believe nothing, you know, even so far as saying like, I don't believe that I exist, um, or you just have to accept that everything you believe is irrational. I don't think that you quite have to go that far, questioning your properly basic beliefs. Yeah, so wait, wait, hold on. You gotta, have, so you gotta have, even, even if you don't buy into the epistemology, you still so, have to have a, a basic and belief somewhere. Th this might be just somewhere more have wording, have. but I do agree that there have to be like assumptions that you have to make in order to operate in the world. Yeah. 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 Like the I, that's probably what this, that's the similar thing to the properly yeah. It's basic like an belief. axiom in that. Yes, like yeah. first principle. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I'm so. just, I guess it's just seeming strange to me that it, I guess to me, it would seem like you want to try and make sure that you have as minimum of those as necessary. Or like have as minimum, basically, there shouldn't be more basic beliefs that you hold than are necessary to hold. I would say that's accurate because then you're assuming things and then you could call anything basic if you just yeah. want to call it basic. Yeah, um, the, well, so the, the point of warrant is that you have a basic belief it, it, if it is the natural, if, if having that belief is the natural outcome of having a properly functioning, like rational capacity. Mm -hmm. So I believe that I am rational, and that is the proper consequence of me being rational. There's no evidence I can provide for that. It is possible that I'm irrational. 
I know that, but it's irrational for me to believe that I'm irrational, unless I have evidence to show that I'm schizophrenic. Hold on. So I something Kayla was, might be saying is, you can say, we have evidence for God, and we and it's a properly basic belief. Do those at any level conflict with one another? Mm. Is it I wrong to have both? Is it wrong to have evidence for properly basic oh, belief? Not quite what I'm asking, but that is an interesting question. Yeah. There, there is an interesting question here that says, okay, I have a properly basic belief, but now I discover that it's possible for me to actually investigate it and look for evidence. Mm -hmm. So at that point. Once I know that it's possible for me to find evidence, do I still have warrant if I choose not to look for the evidence? I guess that is a good question, yeah. Is it possible to lose warrant once you find a bit, or not Find a way to investigate a properly basic, basic belief? belief whenever it becomes well, properly what, evident. One way, <laughs> can't you look at it that God gives us inside information and external evidence for himself, you know? We, he gives us insight. It's an inside thing. It's, mm. it's an inside job. Yes. But mm. it's also confirmed by external evidence. Did you say yes. Leibniz? Huh? Leibniz? I didn't say Leibniz. No, okay. I think she said it's, it's enlightened. I said it's an inside job. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, so off that note, the extended AC model is built on the idea of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so we have this Holy Spirit that instigates and shows us the truth of the gospel, right? So therefore, if Christianity is true, then we are warranted in believing that, right? Um, one la we're trying to wrap up here, but one last little minor point I want to hit um, that Caleb, you were kind of questioning. It was actually my favorite part of the whole book, and I am going to totally butcher it trying to explain it. So highly recommend you just like go get this. It's like chapter six or something like that. But it talks about this idea of sin, right? Um, and so sin is the basically what divorces us from a morally perfect God in the Christian worldview, right? And so within the Christian world, the sin has corrupted the way we think, right? Um, let me try to find the slide if this works. Um, but basically there was that slide that said, where is it? Oh my goodness. Um, that as we have this Holy Spirit and as we have faith, right, we have we undergo this process of sanctification, which is where our our affections are aligned with God's affections and our thoughts are aligned with God's thoughts, right? Um, so sin basically, when it came into the world and when man fell away from the perfection that God created them in within the Christian worldview in this model, right? Um, we then totally broke. So we no longer hate sin. We love sin, right? We run to sin, right? That's why humans are sinners, um, right? I'm sure we have all would admit to have doing something wrong within the course of our lifetime, right? And I think you're wrong if you say no. Um, <laughs> but I would say that the, you kind of posed this question a little bit before we got off on that tangent, but the process in which we would be 10 feet underwater trying to think philosophy or think philosophically would be in this sinful nature, right? Because we are built to understand the witness of the Holy Spirit enlightening the truth of Scripture, right? Therefore, when we are caught in sin, we do not have this Holy Spirit, and therefore Scripture is not enlightened to us, right? 1 Corinthians 2 is a really, really key passage on this. I would encourage everyone to go read it tonight. It's really short. I read it before this. Um, but it basically talks about how the Spirit witnesses to us and reveals the wisdom of God to us, right? And so the main point I want to hit with that is when we are in sin, we are basically putting, pulling the plug on our interpreter of Scripture, right? The thing that is supposed to enlighten the truth of Scripture to us is cut off from us because we have this dividing wall of sin. Now, when we repent and we believe in the gospel, then that dividing wall of sin comes down through the blood of Christ on the cross, right, and through the atonement, right, and topics like that. And we get to step into fellowship with the Spirit. And as 1 Corinthians 2, 11 or 12 or something like that says, we are given the Spirit of God. And that Spirit is what allows us to examine these truths and better understand them and wrestle with them. Because Christians, the, the moment you become a Christian, you don't stop wrestling. That's not a thing. 
If you do that, you're having this blind faith, which is warranted and is justified, but is very weak and, I would say, unwise, right? But Christians are still wrestling. I would argue that most of the Christians in this room have something they're wrestling with right now, right? Um, and so with this idea of wrestling, then we have the Holy Spirit on our side who can then come and help us dissect Scripture and understand these difficult passages, right? I was doing it with a friend the other day at a coffee shop trying to understand some things that the New Testament talks about that are really unclear when applied to today's society. And so that Holy Spirit is what allows us to interpret and wrestle with Scripture and then ultimately find the truth in it, right? Um, and so our cognitive faculties aren't functioning in the way they were made when we are in sin and we are separated from God because then the Holy Spirit can't reside in us is basically what I'm saying. Does that make sense? My question then is, what, at what point then does it become rational then to actually talk with someone who is in sin? Rational? Because, oh. Well, because specifically if they're in sin, then that just means inherently they're not in the environment that they're able to actually understand this stuff in a rational capacity. It's sort of like we're accusing atheists of the same well, thing Karl Marx was accusing Christians of. <coughs> or it's not even necessarily just that. It would be like instead of Carl, instead of it like you're on drugs or something. It could be some you uh, were some similar impairment. Yeah, you were like for instance you've always lived in a environment that in it's not <laughs> not low enough oxygen to like kill you necessarily, but mm. enough where you can't think logically yeah. anymore. Or, or, <laughs> or yeah, change in the cave. Or it's basically some environment where it's just not possible for you to logic to think logically. So if that is the case, then how can you actually have a conversation with those people without it, it would seem to me that talking to those people in any logical capacity wouldn't It would matter. be impossible. If if a person's cognitive faculties are not properly functioning then there's no reason in, re in reasoning with them because they're not capable of properly reasoning. And right. therefore, right. it would be impossible for Christians to engage so with atheists in good faith. It no. would have to be, it would seem to me it would have to, they would have to already come <coughs> to the conclusion that a God exists before they're able to engage in these intellectual questions. No, and no, no. if they don't, or they're in sin, so I guess, they would have to come out of sin before they can engage in these questions, would be the proper way to say it. In which case, if any of them are in sin, they can't engage with these questions properly. I don't think that's quite accurate. The argument Simon is making is that whenever you have properly functioning cognitive faculties, that involves more than one. So for example, it includes like eyesight, hearing, things like that, as well as the sense of the time. So what he's getting at is that Sin is what impairs the senses to the entitles. So mm -hmm. trying to tell, and I think this is actually pretty pretty accurate. In most cases, if you tell like an atheist, if you pray to God, you'll sense his presence or he'll respond to you or something like that. Most of the time that doesn't work because if they're not convinced that such a God exists uh, and if they're in a moral state where they're closed off to God, why, you know, that senses to the entitles is not going to function. Just as if you were to say, if you were to, Asking an atheist to go pray to God and see if he is uh, making himself known is almost like asking a blind person to just go outside and see how beautiful everything is. <coughs> you know, it, and it's not like you can't talk to a blind person about things, it's just you can't talk on this particular issue. That's why I think so many non-Christians get uh, very frustrated or even annoyed about uh, talking to Christians about religious experience, because that's something that you know, most, most non-Christians don't. In some cases, it happens. In some cases, there are atheists who convert. Like they, you know, they'll they'll drop their guard down and say, you know, I genuinely want to know if God exists, and they have a religious experience that convinces them. Mm -hmm. um, in that case, Plano would say at that point that they've let down their guard and they've allowed their senses to then try to function. They're actually properly functioning in that role, but they're not using a cognitive faculty that they've used uh, prior to, or, uh, prior to that. Um, so in this case. It's not as if you can't talk about any religious thing ever with someone who's not a believer. It's that that particular aspect of talking about a religious experience of somebody who uh, 
doesn't have that you know nodule uh, or module in their in their uh, cognitive faculties working, it's going to be unproductive. If you talk about arguments, evidence, uh, historical facts, you know, philosophical facts, things like that, totally productive. Um, and plan making agrees that you don't have to have belief in God in order to engage in uh, all of those other uh, aspects. It's sort of like seeing shrimp colors all of a sudden. <laughs> all, all the colors that shrimp can see. That's, that sounds like <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, that's all. Sadly, the shrimp thing is also a little bit inaccurate. You know what? I know that, but you don't have to tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> to yourself. Uh, biologist, man. Sweet. Well, I think that's a pretty good place to put a pin in it for tonight. Um, thank you all so much for coming and bringing questions and being willing to listen and willing to discuss. Um, pull up next week for our social. Reach out to me for the address. Ice cream, brownies, pizza, game night. I'll school all y'all in Secret Hitler. So it'll be fun. All right.